Well, it's obvious we're filled with the Spirit. We're singing, songing, and making melody, right? And hopefully we're in thanksgiving, and hopefully we're subject to one another. So, uh, One point I wanted to make for the sermon last night, and I forgot that I think it's really important, is you know that Colossians and Ephesians are parallel texts, right? Based almost on the same outline, with Colossians first, and then Ephesians, a cyclical letter. When it comes to the filling of the Spirit, 518, all of us ask, what does that mean? I mean, describe that. And there are many opinions about what it means. Paul himself gives a definition in those of five participles. But if you look at the parallel, it's not in your Bible because it's a structural parallel, not a word parallel. But in Colossians it says, at the same place, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, is the definition of ever be filled with the Spirit. And that, that kind of introduces today what I want to talk about. And that is a spiritual warfare. We don't talk about this much. Um, it's been amazing to me through the years how many definitive passages on crucial subjects are found in Ephesians. We've got this wonderful passage on predestination in chapter 1, which is only rivaled by uh, Romans 9. We have this wonderful passage on the grace of God, which is, I think, the definitive passage. Then we have that mystery that Jew and Gentile are one. That's unique to Ephesians. Then we have the filling of the Spirit, had this call to unity, and this exposition on spiritual warfare. I want to remind you that Paul's theology began to be developed in Galatians. That's, that's the first book where Paul began to do doctrine. Then that is developed into the book of Romans. And then those two doctrinal expressions become summarized in Ephesians. That's why Ephesians is called the capstone of Paul's theology. I do not believe that the average American Christian realizes they're in a spiritual conflict every day. Now we might see it if there's some crisis in our life, medically, financially, marriage. We might say, oh, this is... But friends, I want to say to you, as we meet the people who serve us, as we meet the counter person, as we meet the person on the street, as we meet the person in the grocery store, there is a spiritual opportunity going on. We live in a world that is more than the five senses. But I don't think we realize our opportunities and temptations because we're somehow blinded to the world we, by the five senses. I often say, if you do not know there is a spiritual conflict, you have already lost the battle. <laughs> There's no way to prepare for that which you do not realize. So I hope that God will open our eyes today to help us see a truth unique to Ephesians in many ways that Paul wants to give to the church. Okay? So if you have your Bible, I don't think you have my notes on this, so if you will uh, turn to Ephesians 6, I'm going to do 10 through about 19. And um, I'm going to take just about 30 minutes because I know you've got to check out too. So I've asked Jim to stand up five minutes before my time is up. So I want you to know if I go long, it's Jim's fault. <laughs> um, there are so many things here I, I want to talk about. Let's go into the text itself. Now, you know, when, when a preacher says finally, verse 10, it doesn't mean all that much. <laughs> Uh, literally, this means for the rest. It is really a textual marker for I am transitioning into my last major point. Now, the major point may go on for a long time, but what he's saying is we're going to move to a different subject. It may surprise you. You know, whenever Paul uses the word brother, that is a textual marker for the transition to a new subject. You ever thought about that? Next time you see brother in Paul, see what he's doing. He's changing to a new paragraph, a new subject. It's only Paul that does that. Uh, be strong in the Lord. Now, I want to read this to you. I, I hope you'll hear what I'm saying. Koine Greek is an inflected language, but it was in, it's, a, it's a language that's not classical Greek. It, it's, it's been uh, reduced in uh, complexity. And the forms are changing. So sometimes, in rare occasions, you can't tell if it's a passive voice or a middle voice. Now, if it's passive, the subject is being acted upon. This would be God working through us. If it's middle, it means that we are willing and open to participate in what God's going to do for us. Now, this is the form here, and you can't tell which it is. So let me read this brief summary. The paradox between the passive voice, God's power flowing through the believer, 
and the middle voice, believers actively involved in living for Christ, is the dialectical tension found throughout the Bible. Basically, it is the tension of a covenant relationship. Now, would somebody turn their Bibles to Philippians 2, 12 and 13 for me? Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Be ready to read that in just a moment. God always takes the initiative, always sets the agenda, but he has also chosen that humans must respond initially and continually. Sometimes the Bible emphasizes mankind's response and sometimes God's provision. So who will read Ephesians 2, 12 and 13? So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not, in, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you hear the terrible paradox there? Yeah. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's God who works within you. Now, they're both there. I want to show you one more place where it's been startling to me. And this is, I'm sure I found this because I'm an Old Testament guy. But will you turn to me, in just two places, <laughs> to Ezekiel 18. And then keep your finger there and put your finger in Ezekiel 36. And I want to show you how the Bible itself uh, gives these two sides to the same question. Ezekiel 18. I want to look at verse 31 and 32. I'll read these for you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. Do you see the emphasis? Make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Would you turn over to Ezekiel 36? And listen here. I'm, gonna, I'm in Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 26. Now, if you know, beginning in verse 22, Israel has failed so miserably, God says, You have embarrassed me throughout the world. I have been with you and blessed you, and everywhere you've gone, my name has been impugned because you don't obey. Therefore, I will. The number of I wills. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. Verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Let me ask you a question. Am I supposed to make myself a new heart, a new spirit? Or does God give me a new heart and a new spirit? And the answer is yes. It's not A or B. It's A and B. A does not happen without B. And B can't happen without A. To separate those, I think, is the theological danger. And uh, because... Well, I'm, I'm, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Okay, I want to look at the word uh, in the strength of his might. Uh, again, if you have your Old Testament, would you open to Isaiah 59? Isaiah 59. I don't know if you've recognized it when you read this, but many of these quotes that are in this short text are coming out of, out of Isaiah. So I'm going to look at Isaiah 59, verses 15 through 17. I'll read these. Yes, the truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself pray. Then a new paragraph. Now the Lord says, it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice, and he saw there was no man, and was astonished there was no one to intercede. When his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him, and he put on righteousness like a breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself in zeal as a mantle. Now, do you, if you know this text, these are the quotes coming back into the spiritual warfare text. This is my best analogy. There is a spiritual conflict. Things are not settled at salvation. Now, I've heard many theologians say, at salvation, the old man is taken out and the new man is taken in. That has not been my experience. The old man in me is alive and well. The Jews say, in every man's heart is a black and a white dog. And the one you feed the most is the one that becomes biggest. I have found that to be true. So I think the new nature is put in beside the old nature. So we have an ongoing temptation after salvation. We recognize the need for something more than, than just um, church on Sunday morning or a devotional reading uh, 
with a half a verse and a warm fuzzy. God has showed us there is an ongoing need. He has provided everything we need for the conflict. But we must do two things. We must recognize there is a conflict. We must recognize God's provision. And we must personally, daily, intentionally implement it in our lives. None of this is guaranteed maturity. I've met some really old baby Christians. No, no, we must recognize this spiritual armor. Now, I can't define this armor for you exactly. I know many uh, sermons have tried. I don't think that's the point. The point is there's an ongoing conflict. That God knows that and has provided for us what we need. And I want to say to you as strongly as I know how, the Christian life is as much a supernatural gift as is salvation. And uh, it must be intentionally received. Okay. Now notice, notice where it um, mentions this. Um, lost my place. Put on the full armor of God. Now this is a, an aorist. It means complete. Make a decisive action. Uh, it's a, there's a sense of urgency to it. God has provided it. But we must implement it. And we implement this so we'll be able to stand. Notice this is not attack hell with a water pistol. This is hold your ground. This is a, either a military term or a wrestling term. We're not sure which. Uh, both fit. But it's, it's stay, stay stable. Remember I told you that the, that the original etymology for the word believe, trust, and faith is a stable stance? Uh, if it's a military term, it's hold your own ground. If it's an athletic term, it means don't be overthrown. So we are to put on the full armor that we'll be able to stand. The word stand appears over and over in here, which means it's got to be a key word. God wants us to be able to hold our own in a fallen world. And then it says, against the schemes of the devil. I have tried to think, what schemes was the devil using in the life of these Christians who received this letter? We're talking about Western Turkey in the middle of the, of the first century. I've listed some things, and you, there, you could probably list more. This is not a definitive list, and the text itself does not list it. But thinking about these, these, these new Christians who are being assaulted by false teachers in the midst of a culture of paganism. So here's a list. Disunity, personal sin, false teachers, discouragement, apathy, physical suffering. Now, that's not just the first century. I know we sit here in this beautiful building, with wonderful food. But I guarantee you most of the world, Christians went hungry this morning. And they gather in huts and under trees. And uh, we, we, we are the pampered elite. Thank God. I mean, I, I, I don't want to feel guilty and give everything away. I don't think that's what I'm supposed to do. But I do need to remember that there are more Christians dying today than have ever died in the history of the church. And I do need to remember that there is a spiritual battle even in American culture. Because God loves Americans just like he loves the people around the world in poverty. That we're fighting a different kind of fight than they're fighting. But it's still a fight again for the hearts and souls of human beings. Made in the image and likeness of God. Um, our struggle is not, this, it's present tense, our ongoing struggle, our temptation is not. Now surprisingly, your Bible in verse 12 probably has against flesh and blood. Did you know in the Greek text it says blood and flesh? That's exactly backwards of what's normal for the rabbis and normal for the first century. The only other place flesh and blood appears is in Hebrews. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why that is unless it's something about the Gnostic false teachers and an emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. It's, it's just really uncharacteristic of all the other places in the Bible. It, it's, it's in the normal order of flesh and blood, but here it's in blood and flesh. Now against rulers, against powers... Um, now, and I mentioned to you earlier, in, if I was in Romans 13, these would be governors and, and government officials. But in this text of, of Gnostic false teachers and their view of the angelic world, uh, for, if you go to whatever grocery store you go to, when you go to check out, there's a horoscope right there today. If you have your paper, it's right next to the TV guide, right? There are people in our world who believe that there are powers behind the, the night lights, 
and that the, those, those patterns on which they were born or the pattern that is happening now in the rotation of the planets around the sun have something to do with their lives. Uh, aren't you appalled at the hold that superstition has on the world? Now, <laughs> I've seen superstition in Christians too, right? But... Um, First of all, I need to recognize that the stars are, is not what I'm in conflict with, but I am in conflict. Now, I'm going to go back to the three sources, the three enemies of man from chapter 2. I'm in conflict with a fallen world system that offers me hope and joy and peace if I have more and more and more. I'm in conflict with a personal force of evil that wants to hurt and embarrass God by hurting and embarrassing me. And I have an inner propensity for more and more for me at any cost. Now, these are the things that we constantly face, even after salvation. And I think, I think we forget that. And we don't recognize that in chapter 5, being filled with the Spirit is illustrated by the relationships in the Christian home. I submit to you that... Spiritual warfare is also dealing with, with the interpersonal relationships of our lives. And that people we come in contact are watching how we treat them. If being filled deals with interpersonal relationship, spiritual conflict. Now, I, I'm trying to kid you, there are some people drive me nuts. There are none here, of course. Uh, <laughs> some people drive me nuts. But that's true of everybody, right? So, this is where love one another becomes not an option, becomes a mandate. Spiritual warfare can be clearly seen in how we treat each other. Now, this is not meant to be ugly, but it is. I have found more fellowship in bars than I have in churches. It's just, just not right. <clears throat> against world forces of darkness. Now, you ever, I remember when I was a, a child, I still remember going to a doctor and he had a picture of the, the ancient world as they thought they, you know, there were ships and the continents looked funny. And over the top of these two circles was a man on a throne. You remember that picture? That's the, that in Greek classical mythology, that's the cosmo crater. That is the world control, that's this word. That's this word. So this is the idea of a, 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 a ultimate power trying to overcome the world. The cosmo crater here. Against forces of wickedness and darkness. Against spiritual forces. Now this is the idea of astronomy. That behind uh, people's lives are these angelic or uh, little g gods that control human destiny. And uh, Paul is saying we wrestle against that. We wrestle against the mythology of the pagan world and we wrestle against the reality of a spiritual realm where some of the spiritual realm is not on our side. Thank God I, ours is bigger but <laughs> you know I live in, in Caddo Lake and they filmed uh, the creature of the black lagoon there. Remember that old black and white movie? The, the house is still there. And when I was little you know you'd watch these shows and uh, You'd go, oh, scare you to death. So you know the rule is if you get in bed and cover up, they can't get you. But boy, if you have to go to the bathroom, you're open game, right? So I, <laughs> I can remember walking to the bathroom quoting 1 John. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the bathroom. <laughs> and there have been times in my life that I need to know that my spiritual forces and equipment has already overcome the forces of evil. Uh, I, I, don't need to, I don't need to try to find victory. I need to cling to victory, right? Uh, my big brother is really something in the universe. And he is with me and for me. I, we need to keep that in mind. And then it says, take up the full armor of God. Again, another heiress, decisive action. I have got to implement this armor. Now, I know there are many, many sermons where you, where you try to define what this armor is. I think that is a, a little too much reading into the text because most of this text is coming from where? Isaiah 59, right? Where God is a divine warrior. It is his uh, uh, soldiering stuff that we're talked about here. I always get tickled, when, really, when Paul wrote this. He's in prison in chains, right? 
And you would say, oh, poor Paul. <laughs> Paul didn't see it that way. You know, every eight hours, two more young Roman soldiers are handcuffed to this little Jewish evangelist. Can you hear those Roman soldiers saying, oh, Lord, please take my turn. That guy. <laughs> and you know where Paul said, don't you, don't you be sad because the gospel has penetrated the Praetorian Guard. He may have saw those soldiers on each side of him wearing their armor. Or he may have gone back to the Isaiah 59 text. I don't know. But that's where this is coming from. So, that, that take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist. Now, there are all kinds of ways we resist. We resist personal temptation. We resist uh, sad circumstances that come in our life. We resist having our feelings hurt. There's many things. But we're able to resist because we know there is a spiritual battle ongoing in the life of saved people. And there is God who is with us and provided everything we need to overcome and come through. And having done everything, this is the ideal of standing, stand firm. Um, I've mentioned here in, in my notes, and I want to just go over it. Believers are commanded and encouraged to resist, overcome, and stand against the schemes of the devil. This is done by means of. Now what I'm going to do is list, do a litany of things you have that overcome evil. There's, there's six of them I have listed. Believers' knowledge of the gospel might be the helmet of salvation. I heard somebody say, I forgot who said, the way to define great preaching is telling Christians what they already are in Christ. That's a pretty good definition, I think. Okay, So we know the gospel. Believers position in Christ. We are in Him. We have positional righteousness and sanctification. Number three, Believers' yieldedness to the indwelling spirit. There's that passive voice. Believers' implementation of the armor provided by God. Believers' decisive choices and actions. And then prayer. Now I'm going to come back to that in verse 18 and 19. But I think when you see these, we recognize in practical terms how we're able to resist. One, one reason I'm really frightful of the American church is that she is so easily tricked because she does not know scripture for herself. So anybody that comes along and has a tie and a degree from some school they heard and uses a biblical word just sweeps them off their feet. They do not know how to resist because they do not know the promises of scripture. And um, I, I worry about that. Now verse 14 is where all of these quotes coming at most out of Isaiah. There are several of them in a row. Four. And he's going to quote these Old Testament texts about this armor. Now, you can see the breastplate may be knowledge. I often pick on the, verse 16 the word shield. Um, I'm a little crude in this illustration, so don't get mad, um, please. The word shield is the Greek word door, okay? There are two shields in the Roman world. One's a round one you put on your arm for hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the other one is a big shield. It's so big they call it a door. The one reason the Roman army was never defeated except by the Parthian cavalry is because they had a formation called the turtle. And what happened, the soldiers on the outer formation linked their shields together, little metal things, those shields linked together, and the ones in the middle put those shields up. So they protected one another from arrows and shields and rocks. And it was a wonderful military force. We each have this shield. And we are meant to link this shield together in the church as a barrier between unbelief and evil. Uh, but we're so... We're so prone to shoot each other in the butt that we've had to put our shield behind us to protect us from other Christians and not link it together against the lost world. And the reason you're not smiling because you've been there. We have this shield for the world. And we're having to use it because we're so unloving to each other. Now, the evil one is mentioned here. It's very difficult some deny, times to know if it's the evil one, Satan, or evil in, in, in essence. And it's very hard, in the, um, even in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. This could be the evil one. It could be evil in general. And it's because the Greek is ambiguous. I assume in this text, because we're talking about the cosmic crater, uh, and we're talking about the schemes of the devil. That's where I think this is probably the evil one. And there is an evil one. I think he is an angelic being, though I cannot prove that. I think the texts that we try to use are not really good for that. But I don't know what else to say about him. Um, but I, I guess I 
I keep reminding myself that he, of Martin Luther's hymn. It just gives me goosebumps. You know, Martin Luther, uh, he was really a schizophrenic in many ways. Uh, suffered depression all of his life. Felt like he was always surrounded by evil and demons. There's even the, the traditional thing. He threw the inkwell at a demon in his room one night. Uh, pestered by the sense of, of, of spiritual evil. But if you know that and then you hear his, his song... And it talks about, you know, that the evil prevails. And then it says, one little word will fail him. And what's that little word? Jesus. You know, it's kind of like uh, in Romans 8, 26, where it says, The Spirit prays for us without words because we don't know how to pray. How many times in my life, in temptation, in confusion, uh, in, in misunderstanding, in hurt feelings... I, I just say, Jesus, I don't know what's happening, but I do trust you and I pray you would help me get through this, right? I think there's a little word that we need to lean on in these times. Because, brothers and sisters, you have a tattoo. And the people who know you in your family, neighborhood, friends, and where you work know who you are. And everywhere we go, that tattoo is right on our forehead. This one belongs to Jesus. Now, how do they live? How do they act? How do they resist? How do they deal with prosperity? How do they deal with suffering? On and on it goes. But um, it is crucial. We have this shield. We have this helmet. Now, I've often read many sermons that there is one offensive weapon and all these others are defensive. The, the armor of God is defensive except for the one here in verse 17. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, uh, the Word of God is two things, as you know. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Now, it goes back to the Hebrew concept of the power of the spoken Word in the Old Testament. Creation is by the spoken Word. Uh, Isaiah 55, 11, my Word does not go out from me void without accomplishing that which is purpose. Then John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. So, the Word is both a message and a person. So the sword of the Spirit, I think, is the gospel. It's the, it's the truth of the gospel. And that is our offensive weapon. But I have, most of the American Christians that I have met do not have a sword. They have a pen knife. It's about that long. You get on an airplane with it. Because most of them do not know the Bible. They know some verse that somebody told them somewhere. They never read the verse before or the verse after. I, I, let me just give you a quick illustration. How am I doing, Jim? <laughs> I went down to South Texas and this lady said, you teach the Old Testament. Where does it say you can't sell your dog? I said, well, I don't think the Bible says you can't sell your dog. She said, we had a man come through here and show us in Deuteronomy where it says you can't sell a dog. The verse says, do not give the hire of a dog, King James. A dog in Deuteronomy is a male prostitute of the Canaanite fertility cult. Not Fifi, uh, precious, bubbly, no, no. And that guy quoted that and those women in that church did not have the biblical knowledge to look the text up and read the verse before it and the verse after it before they had to start leasing their dogs. <laughs> Now that's the kind of crazy superstition I find in the church. It's a love for the Bible, but an ignorance of the content of the Bible. You can put the Bible on the dashboard and you will still get a ticket. That woman the bus driver ought to get a ticket. The Bible is not magical, amen? It's the message that brings life, not its presence. And I think we forget that. I have five Bibles. You'll still go to hell if you don't trust Christ. And you'll still be in jeopardy if you don't know what it says. We need, we need to be doing the study ourselves. So I believe a knowledge of the Word of God is crucial. But I am always moved by verse 18 and 19. And I think there is a contextual flow here that's absolutely crucial. Notice the number of alls, pos and pon, in this first verse. Five alls. I can't think of a more inclusive verse in the Bible. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Man, ladies, what an encompassing prayer. I don't think just the knowledge of the Bible is an offensive weapon. I think prayer is an offensive weapon. I was mentioning the other day about the, the um, competition sometime between churches. I hope when there is a church in Lubbock that's having a meeting 
It's trying to help Christians grow or trying to help people come to know Christ. It may be another denomination, but I hope you take time to pray for them. I hope you don't feel bad if people are joining other churches. Uh, really, it's not about my fishbowl versus your fishbowl. It's about the kingdom. And if somebody, a, a, a leader in town of a church is having a struggle, shouldn't we pray instead of just pass it on and gossip? Come on, aren't we a family? Now what grabs me about this is, is two things. Number one, I mean I'm to pray for all things. You know, Paul, I told you earlier, he prayed for churches he didn't even start. And after they were mean to him, years later, he prayed for those churches. I've always been bothered. I surrendered to preach at First Baptist Church, Bel Air, Texas. I was 21. Uh, I was licensed and ordained there. And I have never got a letter from that church telling me they're praying for me. Not one letter. I mean, they have a responsibility to me. They have a responsibility to me. And you have those in your congregation. They may have left. They may have gone. They may have been staff members. for Even if under bad conditions, you need to pray for them. You need to write them. You need to encourage them. And if they hurt you, you need to forgive them so that won't come that root of bitterness in you. Pray for all people at all times. Man, what a... Per and then it says, in the Spirit. Um, I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, I've listed some things possibly. The Spirit praying for believers. That's at Romans 8. Christians praying in spiritual power. Jude 20. Uh, the parallel from John 4, 23. Pray in spirit and truth. The Spirit as distinct from the mind. I certainly believe in speaking in tongues. I don't do that, but I think it's a valid gift. And those who have it uh, seem to be very uplifted by it. But all times in the Spirit, be alert with all perseverance and pray for all the saints. And then finally I close with this. And here is Paul sitting in prison, chained these soldiers. If I was in prison for the gospel, I'd be praying, get me out of here. Look what I've done for you. I need to preach on so I can have more people. No, 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 that's not Paul. That's not Paul. Here he is sitting in that cold little cell. And he says, pray for me. First of all, that the Apostle Paul felt he needed intercessory prayer from other Christians. Very important. Secondly, what does he pray for? Boldness. To preach the gospel.